allow me to draw your attention to this curious little camera, the ZWO ASI 533MC Pro. Why is it curious? It has a square sensor on it. This confuses some people and leaves others questioning why. In this video, I'm going to share my feelings about this cool, dedicated, one-shot color astronomy camera that was loaned to me from First Light Optics. Out of the box, the 533MC Pro comes with a really nice assortment of cables and attachments. I was really fond of it coming with the 36.5mm worth of extension required to get this to 55mm, which is a really common measurement needed for most field flatteners and coma correctors. I did a separate unboxing of this camera that can be found up there or up there, because I never remember which side I need to point to. The little padded case is all well and good. It'll keep the camera nice and safe if you're moving around the house or transporting to a dark sky site or something. But I wouldn't put much stock in this protecting the camera from a significant bang. For that, you're probably gonna want an actual hard case. The ZWO ASI 533MC Pro. Oh, I'm gonna get fed up saying that. The product description of this camera gives it a sensor diagonal of one inch or 25.4 millimeters. In practice though, this is probably more like 0.6 inch, 16 millimeters because of the actual sensor size. The actual sensor is 11.3 by 11.3 millimeters. It has nine megapixels, 80% quantum efficiency and shoots at a native resolution of 3008 by 3008. That's a lot of numbers I've just thrown at you. Getting used to the square sensor took a little bit of a learning curve, but once you got used to it, this camera definitely held its own for imaging and was a lot of fun to use. The bear pattern appears to be RGGB. I say appears because this was really bothersome to find. I couldn't find it written on any documentation on any websites. But when I was using this, I put it down as RGGB and that seemed to work just fine in software such as Deep Sky Stacker, Astro Pixel Processor and so on. So I mentioned 80% quantum efficiency. This is just a fancy way of saying how well the camera uses the light it collects. With an 80 millimeter refractor f6, around the unity gain setting as well, I was using two to three minute long sub-exposures for broadband targets with an L Pro Max filter, and around five minute long sub-exposures for narrowband targets using the Optolong L Enhance filter. And there should be some photos on screen now, and you can see they came out quite nicely, if I do say so myself. To finish off with the sensor, it's 14-bit ADC, which means for flats, you're looking around the 8,000 ADU range. Though in practice, I've been using 6,000 ADU, it's coming out just fine. The sensor also is suitable for focal lengths of 388 millimeters to 1,163 millimeters under normal seeing conditions. So let's jump into Stellarium and let's have a look at some of these field of views. At 400 millimeters, you're looking at things like the Rosette Nebula, NGC 2244, or M33, the Triangulum Galaxy. 600 millimeters, you'll be able to get IC410, the Tadpoles in, or M16, the Eagle Nebula. At 750 millimeters, we're looking at things like the Helix Nebula, or the Moon, they would look quite nice. And 1000 millimeters, the Triffid Nebula would look really good, as well as the Crescent Nebula. Let's talk about Amp Glow now. That really pesky Amp Glow, Starburst, and whatever you want to call it. They advertise zero of that with this sensor. And I agree with them. Let's look at some dark frames. Dark frames are great for looking at this. This is a two minute dark frame at gain 95. Can you see that there's no real Amp Glow? This is a five minute dark frame, same gain. Still no glow or Starburst. So let's compare this to a five minute dark from a 183 sensor. See the difference? How about 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes? When ZWO says this camera has no amp glow, they mean it and they deliver it. This makes calibration and further editing just a breeze, so much nicer. I had a lot of problems trying to calibrate starbursting out with a 183 sensor and I just don't have that issue with this sensor. Wonderful. And now comes the part of the review where I stop fanboying over this camera and tell you the things I don't like about it. I'm not a massive fan of the 9 megapixel sensor. Sure, 3008 by 3008 is plenty of resolution for 1080p HD images, but if you're looking to print your photos at the standard 300 dpi, you're limiting yourself to 10 by 10 inch prints. So I would have really loved to see in a few more megapixels, but each individual photo is only 17.6 megabytes, so it's a bit more manageable on hard disk space or solid state drive, whatever you're using these days. As I mentioned at the start, the square camera does take some getting used to. 
The one power of a square is that you can crop it to any aspect ratio that you want. This though begins eating into your already limited pixel budget. If you try and crop down to a different aspect ratio when you've already filled the frame with your target, which is what most of us try to do, then you're, you're robbing yourself of those pixels. Though in defense of that, if you wanted a 3x2 camera, you wouldn't have bought a 1x1 camera. I did a sensor analysis using SharpCap and then I compared that chart with the manufacturer's chart. Please say that they were accurate. When I was using this camera first, I ended up settling with 95 gain because that's what I felt gave me a good combination of read noise, exposure time, dynamic range and depth of wells. Though I have been now shooting at gain 110, just past Unity. Full well also drops off really fast with this camera. Let me give you an example though of how fast wells drop off. Going from zero gain to 100 gain, which is Unity, where I suspect most people are going to be shooting, you lose 70% of your total well depth. 70% just from going to zero to Unity gain. Mad drop off. Basically, if you want to take advantage of those 50,000 electron deep wells, keep your gain low, you're going to have more read noise, but you have to overcome that with stacking and exposure times. Though as is the norm with ZWI cameras, it doesn't have a power lead in the box. So if you're looking at taking advantage of the two-stage cooling, which I'm assuming you are because you're looking at a pro camera, you need to get buy or supply your own 12 volt DC center tip positive adapter. Though I'm reliably informed from the guys at First Light Optics that the new ASI Air Pro can run the cooling on this camera. And if you're looking at the camera or leads or anything like that, there'll be links to everything in the description below. Finally to video, they advertise 20 frames per second. <laughs> You're not getting that at 3008 resolution. When I was taking these lunar images through USB 3, SharpCut Pro and everything raw and native, I was getting one to two frames per second maximum. Changing it to mono and dropping it down to region of interest on the sensor and using the smaller part of the sensor, of course yielded faster FPS. -ing. The lunar images I used about 150 to 300 milliseconds of exposure time and I kept the gain relatively low. Did use it on Venus, but I kind of accidentally deleted those files. But it did work. It did work. Two frames per second, one frames per second. For temperature control with this camera, the best improvements seem to be had from zero to minus five degrees, minus 10 to minus 15 degrees. I used the camera at minus 15 degrees and it gave me really clean images. But if you're looking for more information on setting camera temperature, you can watch this video from Dr. Glover who made SharpCap. So really then, this camera is sort of the meat in a sandwich between the 183 and the 294C sensors. These are both really popular and legendary sensors. And the price reflects this as well. The ASI 533MC Pro is more expensive than the ASI 183MC Pro, but it's cheaper than the ASI 294MC Pro. And at the time of this video, the 533MC Pro will cost you £856, barring any discounts you may have. The small sensor and the nice size pixels gives this a really generous focal length range as talked about. I did use this on a 2700mm Mac on the moon and on Venus, as I already talked about, and it worked really nicely as long as you don't delete the files. And really, I thought the square sensor was gonna take a lot longer to get used to, but it really didn't. After like one or two nights and a bit of time on Stellarium, I was well away with it. it so easy to get used to. And also just means you can post to Instagram that much easier. Right? So the camera finds itself in an interesting position. As mentioned, it slots perfectly between the 183 and the 294. It's good for solar system work and it's very good for deep sky objects as well. So I feel if you're torn between a high resolution planetary camera or a deep sky object camera, the 533MC Pro is going to have you well covered actually. It's also just fun to use. It's a strange thing to say that it was fun to use. Maybe it was the high sensitivity, maybe it was the lack of amp glow, or maybe it was the square sensor itself. But I just enjoyed my time with it and really enjoyed using it. And to me that's worth something in its own right. Thanks for watching everybody. If you disliked this video, give it a fat thumbs down. But if you liked it, give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing for more videos such as this. There'll be links to everything featured in the description below and let me know, were you confused by the square sensor or did, you excite, did it excite you? 
And with that, it's finally time to say clear skies one and all. Keep looking up, keep them cameras clicking. Thanks for watching.